okay. So I guess to start, like maybe you can just like uh, give an introduction about yourself, how you see yourself these days. Okay, uh, I see myself as a man of many hats and many facets. Uh, in my capacity as a public servant, uh, as a congressman of the 4th District of Congressman, and of course, mm-hmm. I represent the welfare of my constituents. And, you know, they're going through some really tough times uh, during this enhanced community quarantine. So I'm constantly fielding out all these like questions and clarifications and requests, uh, trying to knock on the doors of agencies who are able to assist them. Um, as well as doing my own kind of fundraising among friends, family, and supporters so that we can provide assistance to them. Um, And yeah, basically just trying to inspire confidence uh, uh, in the government Mm -hmm. (laughs) right now because there's a lot of hopelessness going around. Um, Trying to make sure, trying to reassure the people that, you know, they, they do have a, they they have a working government. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're trying to uh, work closely with our local government units, who are the frontliners in responding to their needs. Uh, mm-hmm. Especially now that you know during the quarantine, uh, very few are exempted uh, to be able to continue with their trade. Just the essential, just the essential yes. services. So, like a lot of non-essential workers have to stay at home. They don't have any source of income, livelihood, and you know, there's a lot of people who are still very much in uh, below the poverty line, mm-hmm. and so they rely a lot on welfare from the state. So, yeah, like the post- there's a nightmare that. scenario now of like the social amelioration cards being provided and not enough being given to each barangay. So a lot of families are being excluded from that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you also have this growing clamor from the middle class, who are essentially the ones who are paying taxes and providing income to the state, Mm -hmm. that they need support and amelioration as well. So you have that. Um, And many other uh, peculiarities um, that are distinct to my district. Um, so there's that whole situation um, of, of the district work and then there's yeah. a congressional work which is, you know, we we finished uh, an emergency session a few weeks ago to pass the Bayanian law. Yeah. So now it's really more an implementation and oversight um, of that. But then now we're also discussing uh, phase two which is the economic stimulus yeah. Nice. It has to be rolled out once the quarantine is relaxed or lifted. Because like during the quarantine, the focus is to save lives. Um, yes. But then after the quarantine, the focus is to save livelihood. So with a lot of, you know, micro, small, medium enterprises uh, being displaced, uh, a lot of them are coming back to a new normal so it can't be business as usual. Then we have to uh, be equipped. They have to be equipped uh, to be able to still pursue their trade and their livelihood, um, or else we're really we're really screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, so, economically. Yeah, economically. I mean, props to you guys, though. You passed that legislation for Bainian super quick. I mean. Remember how long it took us for trade one, and then how it got changed so bad in the Senate? I couldn't believe that. It's totally different from what was initially the concept when we were first discussing it. If you remember it all, right? In Paul of Love, yeah. with oh, Mo and Abrea. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think I think so it, there was expeditiousness. There's this expeditiousness now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and prior to this Zoom session that we're having, I was just actually like halfway through um, watching the hearing and the briefing of all the health secretaries present and past okay. on okay. like the health situation. And yeah, it's looking like this global pandemic will eventually devolve into an endemic, uh, which is sort of like, it's going to be like a seasonal kind of flu situation. It's, it's going to be part of the new normal. So, 
Wow. How mm -hmm. government responds to that with the infrastructure, with the systemic lockdowns that have to happen if there's any case yeah, routine, of like, yeah, routine, uh, routine. Uh, any case of COVID in the barangay, then you would have to like lock it down or put it under quarantine and then with all the procedures in place. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we're preparing for that world. Um, but then, of course, on the other hand, I'm also an artist, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, the, for the yeah, I wanted to hear more about that. Actually, I thought you were gonna start with that. To be perfectly oh. honest, <laughs> no, I mean, because I was just literally coming off of like uh like halfway through a committee hearing with all these yeah. experts. So that's I've like, seen you in the committee hearings, man. Yeah, that's the part of my brain that's like active right now. So like going to like the other part. <laughs> Uh, which is like being an artist. Yeah, that's an everyday, that's an everyday um, issue that we're also trying to respond to. Um, I'm one of the lead organizers right now of Open House, which is an online fundraiser to support the displaced workers in the performing arts community. Okay. Um, you know, like I myself as a producer, uh, we were like just one week into what was supposed to be a one month long run of every brilliant thing and lungs. Yeah. Nikki, yeah. Nikki yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. For, amazing, amazing. The preview of every brilliant thing. Um, so I think that was a Thursday, Nikki, no? When yeah, we were it was together. Thursday. It was. And then Saturday, uh, it was reported that there was a case of COVID locally transmitted in Taguig. And oh. already there was fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no yeah, there was fear. There was fear setting in already among audiences, but they still showed up. But a lot of them had masks on, and mm -hmm. we had to radically change the show because there was a lot of contact. Um, but then you know, in theater, show must go on, right? Oh, uh, definitely. That's the line. That's where the line comes from, right? <laughs> that's where the line comes from. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, so that was like. So we got through that weekend and then we were supposed to open lungs the next weekend and Nikki was going to join us for that yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, but then Thursday, March 12, Malakanyam had a live press briefer and yeah, basically they declared the quarantine. Um, so days before that, performances were getting canceled already. But we were still hanging in there until such time that, you know, there was really no other recourse. And then eventually... Uh, the city of the gig told us to shut down mm -hmm. and then we had to postpone the run and you know optimistically thinking that in a week it would go away <laughs> but, but then it ended up being a month nobody knew what it was. i like, mean nobody honest, nobody knew what it was i know it's like it's insane uh this is like unprecedented so um yeah so next thing you know all the other shows uh, that were in rehearsal and were about to open, like Anna in the Tropics of Repertory Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, A Band's Visit by Atlantis Productions, Ram Hari uh, by Ballet Philippines is going to open a week later. Um, and then, yeah, Atenea Blue Repertory was in the middle, or we're just one week into an already sold out run of yeah. Next to Normal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Decada Setenta uh, of Black Box Production had just announced an extension because they were sold out. So, um, so that extension also didn't materialize anymore. So all these companies started shutting down. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like a bunch of us in the industry got together, put up this open house fundraiser because we realized that our workers will be displaced. Like yeah. they have no source of livelihood or income and mm -hmm. most of most of that comes from shows and live events um mm -hmm. and all of that is uh banned during this time of quarantine and Definitely. even when it's lifted it's the moratorium on these live event on these uh mass gatherings will probably continue yeah mm -hmm. that's what i heard as well from chris roman and uh, rico bernabe they're saying the same thing yeah exactly uh, even when they lighten the quarantine, they're still not going to be allowing uh, mass gatherings. And, uh, exactly. So, I mean, it's, they're, they're talks now of schools, of schools, mm -hmm. like pursuing an online uh, That's it. class yeah. system yeah. until like end of the year or even well into next year. 
Uh, I'm reading all the literature now uh, of like the state of Broadway and West End and even the concert industry. Uh, everyone's projecting like a, a freeze of like six months to one year. And yeah, I, I start to worry about the welfare of of all these workers. Uh, yeah. You know, behind the scenes, uh, mm-hmm. the stage managers, the production managers, the dressers, the musicians, yeah. Uh, yeah. the artists, the artist teachers. I mean, yeah. it's a whole I don't ecosystem. Know if yeah, because for barangay daw, hindi pantay-pantay ah, sa ibang mga lugar. Yung isang barangay daw, okay yung bigay, yung kakabila, parang sobrang talo naman. It really doesn't, it's not equitable, I would say. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Okay, going back naman to that issue. Um, mm, yeah, because like you were saying, kawawa sila, they don't have Our production salary. industry then. So we... the solution yeah, is exactly, going to Yeah, with yeah, the production industry, I mean, it's also going to be affected. Same, yeah, exactly. And the, the worst, the, the ones who are worst, they're not worst off the, for the ones, the ones who are the gaffers, the lightsmen. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we're pull, like at least our industry is pretty small, so we're trying to raise funds for them. But shit, if we don't get, if we don't start earning in the next few months, everyone's gonna get hit. Everyone's gonna yeah. feel it, and they yeah. won't be able to help. We'll probably be okay, but those that are like basically living from what, um, uh, one shoot to another, it's really, that's why, yeah. it's really gonna worrying, like, talaga. Like worrying like talaga. Barangay assistance program that's being. I mean, thank God for that. At least there's a budget, but it depends on how efficient their chairman is at uh, using that fund. You know, so I, it goes back to an institutional problem, Nikki, and it was so, it was just so, I guess, providential that a month before quarantine, uh, which is like maybe the last few weeks of Congress before we went on break, yeah. uh, they had already tackled my freelance protection bill okay. um, in the committee level. And it was referred to uh, a technical working group. So it was going to be in that level already of legislation. Next. And, and uh, something that I was really championing through this bill is uh, to require all freelancers to enter into contracts with the people who hire them just yeah. and then to to clearly stipulate uh in the contract uh the payment the mode of payment the schedule of payment uh what what constitutes as a violation of the contract and all of that which will serve as protection for freelancers mm-hmm. which is like a specific type of worker that escapes a lot of protection from the state yeah Exactly. So I'm sure you can relate to that, Nikki, super, like your the production industry. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, clients who who are very late in terms of their payment payments, yeah. for project. And w- in times like these where, you know, you kind of need the money, you need the liquidity, it's like there are still these persisting institutional problems that have to be addressed. So... Um, yeah, we were like, so it was referred to a tactical working group and then the quarantine happened. So now I think it's really more of all these industries are getting together. I'm already touched with Stephen Ku and the live events industry. I told them. No to way. Meet. Say hi. We're they have to meet. <laughs> sorry, sorry, snap. So you, 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 you're working with Stephen? No, I, I got in touch with them and I told them that their stakeholders already have to meet. And okay. deliberate on um, their prognose, their projections of the industry, and how they will be affected in this new normal in a post-COVID world, so oh, that they can come up with a position paper, so that it can be submitted to Congress and to the interagency task force. Yeah, I guess. So it can be Good taken job, into consideration. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. We're also and the college- support from different industries. Yeah. It's like. So, yeah, like within the performing arts industry now, like we're also consolidating, gathering mm-hmm. the data, how many mm-hmm. workers, how much income is this place? Because these are all the figures and data that is missing and lacking because yeah. we're not organized. Parang everybody is kind of freelancing and trying to do their own thing. But mm-hmm. what we don't realize is that we also need to band together so that we can move things along such as yeah. protection from the state yeah so something like this 
uh, for freelancers, they are not considered formal workers. So they also don't get to avail of the CAMP, which is the emergency employment, uh, sorry, CAMP is the assistance from so Dole. So, what's the assistance of Barangay? No, from Dole. They're, they don't... Ah, Dole. Oh, yeah, the 5,000. Yeah, right. yeah, the 5,000. They don't get yeah, to avail yeah. of that because they're not okay. formal employees. On they the don't have 13-month pay. They don't have paid leaves. They don't have benefits. Mm-hmm. They don't have all of that. Um, so, they're very vulnerable. But neither are freelancers indigent. Neither are they among the low-income families that will receive the social amelioration card. Understood. Yeah. 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 Actually, another one. By the one of ADP, they have that project. It's food naman that they give out straight. Well, it's not like the four-piece uh, it was cash. And then now... Are you talking about the food assistance packages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so using the calamity fund of the local government unit... It's diff- that's different. Right? Which Those is different. Different altogether. Um, each LGU has the okay. capacity to buy food assistance packages for the f- different families. Of course, they have a database and they're going to prioritize the vulnerable. That part. So again, a lot of freelancers don't get to experience any kind of support, both from yeah. national government and local government. So they're kind of like in limbo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, so but that's like, also why we, but, but talk, we like, put up an answer. I mean, I'm curious about like, I mean, I've been watching different uh, news uh, articles and, you know, listening to podcasts about how the different countries are approaching this uh, crisis. And I think like, I remember reading one with the Netherlands that they, they kind of want to introduce some f- version of uh, universal basic income. And I feel because here in the Philippines, you know, majorities are living below the poverty line. Well, right. Is the government looking into this? Like, because parang now, like the work is not even a. It's people don't have a choice right now. Like only the essentials are needed to like keep going. But for the rest of us, and this is going to be the new. If this will be the new normal, like what's going to happen? Exactly. So that's something that uh, you know, government right now is trying to figure out. Uh, we're not a welfare state, okay? So we are not, you know, uh, you know, just yeah. dispensing. Not socialist. No. This, yeah. We're not just dispensing assistance, like uh, never ending, as if there was infinite resources. Also, so have have to be have to be strategic about this and. Uh, one some of the highlights of the economic stimulus package is, yeah, well, basically uh, targeted support to vulnerable industries. Um, gosh, I can't even imagine how tourism is going to bounce back after this whole crisis. Yeah. They're the most heavily impacted. They're actually double whammy because uh, in the Moody's heat map of affected industries, tourism is the most impacted. And then... Uh, the the hotel accommodation industry is also yeah. impacted, like in the second year. But that's also part of the 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 value chain of tourism. Mm-hmm. It's so a ripple like, effect. It's so it's like it's, so they're like doubly screwed, um, and that's why we. Uh, I mean, a lot of resources have to be infused into that. There's so many um, in other industries that are impacted as well. Um, retail that's non-food. Yeah. So you're talking, you know, clothes, fashion, um, yeah. even a lot, even how a lot of services uh, will uh, continue in this new normal. It's just unimaginable. Like, how can you, how can you uh, have a barbershop business? Yeah. How can you have people cut hair while still practicing social distancing? How can you have a spa? How can you have a nail salon? Yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, restaurants. Restaurants, for example. If you have a seating capacity of 100 seats, uh, but with social distancing, you're going to have to have fewer tables, fewer seats, then you can only earn as much as like maybe half of that. So 50. 50 seats. Uh, but how are you going to recover the costs yeah. um, that you incur per day? So... Where will you pass it on to the consumer? 
So you're gonna have to raise your the prices of your food. Yeah. But then, aside from all of that logistical nightmare, you also have to think, how are you gonna combat the stigma and the fear factor of people going out of their homes? Yeah. Right? Parang, yeah. why will I go out? Why will I go to a mall? Why will I go to a restaurant? Diba? Yeah. Uh, or in my case, why will I go to the theater where I will be in an enclosed space uh, breathing the same Bubble air? Bear. <laughs> right? <laughs> breathing the same yeah. air, being shoulder to shoulder with people depending on the intimacy of the theater. Mm. So... I was talking to Audie Himora like a few days ago and then he had the theater at Solaire and they have a seating capacity of 1,800 and they were already, you know, doing some studies on social distancing mm -hmm. um, and how do you do that uh, within the theater? So do you sit them like uh, every two, two seats or apart. three seats? Yeah, yeah, I get you. So like a 1,800 seater theater can be like will just be 600 seats na lang. Yeah. Or like an RCBC, which is 500 seats, will be like, I don't know, 150 to 170 seats. Yeah. So with that little seats to sell, and the cost that you have to... And uh, then premium and pa, but people aren't... Profit, yeah. So it's like, how much are the tickets are gonna cost na? Will it even exactly. be affordable? Exactly. Then, again, going back, uh, theater and a lot of these other industries that are so close to my heart are considered non-essentials in this new normal. So will people even spend their money on, like, say, going to a concert or going to a play? Or even yoga. Like, you know, it's interesting because, like, I've been... In the first month of the lockdown, everyone, every studio, every freelancer, was they were giving free classes. But yeah. I noticed once they, when they extended the lockdown, you start seeing people and freelancers posting, okay, I'm going to start charging 300 pesos, 250 pesos. But the thing is, there's still a lot of bigger um, yoga enterprises that are still um, giving free classes. So we can't really compete with that. I mean, maybe we'll get one student, two students. Yeah. But like, the fear is real looking forward. If let's say, basically we slashed our prices 50%, and our students are 50% less pa. So parang it's like, it's scary. Like, I choose yeah. not to think about it because it's like, this is just gonna get worse. How do we even like, you know, um, put this thing into our perspective to be able to integrate this reality into our real lives? Like Nikki, to be, to be honest, so, so we reconnected. I saw you like when you watched Every Billion. Yeah. And like, I think even a week before that, uh, parang we were already in touch and I was talking about wanting to attend your class. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, and then another friend of mine uh, started a yoga class or a yoga studio with candles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I forget. Other, other, movement. other movement. Other movement, yeah. So I've been wanting to take these classes, um, but then my paranoia over COVID started as early as January. I was the only one in Congress coming to work with a, with a mask on. Wow. And everywhere I went, I was wearing like a surgical mask because I was really paranoid. I was like spraying everybody. It's like, oh, get away from me. Or when people touch me, I was like, <laughs> I'll alcohol them. And you know, I, it even got me into trouble at one point because like, uh, I remember attending a, a, a sortie in the district in Pangasinan uh, for this inauguration or groundbreaking of this bridge. Okay. And I was wearing a mask when everybody else wasn't wearing a mask. And then parang, uh, supposedly it got reported in the media that parang, why was I wearing a mask? Oh, sure. You know what I mean? But I was like, oh, you know what? I'm so sorry, but like safety first. And if yeah. I had the COVID, if I had the COVID, then I would have infected everybody as well. Who, who would have thought that it would become our new normal? Yeah, I've been wanting to attend these yoga classes, but then I was like, to be breathing in and out yeah. in, a, in a closed space. I was like, oh man, like I don't think I don't think I can do this until this whole COVID thing is like settled. And I mean, true enough, yeah, it evolved into a global pandemic. Yeah. So it's like, 
what's going to happen to the yoga studios, to all the fitness studios, the spinning studios, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's very, it's very, it's scary. It really is. But, but Toph, I'm curious about like how you're, you're coping, you so many responsibilities, like on a personal level, how are you dealing with all this? What's keeping you sane? Uh, you know, in, in any other case, I would have been heartbroken that we had to uh, cancel every brilliant thing in lungs. But then there was hardly even any time to like process the grief that yeah. came with it. Because like, I just found myself launching into all of these initiatives and mm-hmm. into this forward motion of just trying to figure out how to help uh, all the affected uh, stakeholders, whether in my district or whether in the performing arts industry. And it's so funny because like maybe the first few days of the, of the quarantine, and I had to go on self-quarantine because I was possibly exposed to somebody with COVID um, because on the last day of Congress, when, we were, when I was chairing a technical working group for the Eddie Garcia bill, uh, which is for the occupational safety standards in the yeah. film and TV industry. Yeah, I remember that. Um, on the other room, right across ours, there was a resource person that days later tested positive for COVID. Oh, fuck. So I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, I'm going to go to the Did we uh, bump into each other in the hallway? Uh, you know, the staff that comes in and out of these rooms, you know what I mean? And then parang in the printing office, there were two employees that tested positive also. So they, these are the ones who print out all the handouts that we touch. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, so I really had to go and self-quarantine. Um, the first few days, uh, you know, it's, it's tuning into the news and trying to make sense and also coordinating constantly with the district on what is needed, what's the situation there. But then, you know, I still had time. I still had time to watch my Korean novella. There's a lot of time talaga. That's the, that's the crazy part. No, that's the thing. No, the first few days or first few, the first week or so, I had time to like watch. I was able to finish three Korean novellas. I did. Um, well, maybe just the last Chloe. episode of Crash Landing on You. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, right. I'm not a uh, kid fan, but I really love it. Okay, and then I did What's Wrong with Secretary Kim, and then I did Eat Taiwan Class, and on top of that, I was watching all these other uh, shows of mine as well, because like I'm a I'm a TV guy, and that's how I relax when I watch shows. Um, but then lately, I just haven't even had time to like watch all these things because I have all these, I have all these like uh, initiatives on my plate, yeah. and Open House, which is that online fundraiser that uh, I'm the lead coordinator for. Um, every day we have programs online, which are free, and it's a mix of like classes, workshops. Uh, panel discussions, even live readings of plays. All, all of these are free. Uh, but then we encourage people to donate uh, yeah. through, our, through our ticketing partner, which is ticket to me to support 130 workers. So we provide 2,000 pesos of cash assistance to the vulnerable displaced workers. Um, I mean, it, it's pantawed really. It's yeah, just to guide yeah. over during this quarantine. So that's been keeping me busy. Um, we're a team of over 100 people who are coordinating constantly via Viber. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're working with Film Development Council of the Philippines, uh, Chairwoman Lisa Seguera. So she's been very helpful. Uh, I'm also in touch with Chairman Nick Lizasso of the NCCA so that they can realign some of their programs uh, uh, and funds to be able to support displaced cultural workers. Uh, I'm also in touch with CCP through Chris Meliado. So they're also realigning some of their funds to be able to support uh, displaced workers because Open House is a private sector initiative. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, Ryan Kayabiab's Bayanian Musikahan. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so been busy with that. Uh, But then 
uh, starting last week, you're right, Nikki, you kind of touched upon it already. Um, you have to start thinking about sustainability moving forward. Mm-hmm. So at some point, all this, all this fundraising, there will be donors fatigue. And people will run out of funds to be able to support causes and other people. And they're going to start saving up for themselves because there's no income coming in. And then we, I start to think about the welfare of you know workers uh, in the performing arts community or freelancers in general. There are yeah. millions of freelancers in the Philippines. So now, parang we're looking forward uh, into initiatives uh, such as like maybe an online marketplace where freelancers can um, you know peddle their services online in exchange for uh, a fee. Um, so at least it's sort of it's a it's a way of you know providing some kind of sustainability, even if it's not the way it used to be. At least there's some income coming in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then for uh, you know producers like myself, and for theater companies, production companies, we're starting to look into the streaming model. Um, like if you're able to stream, that's sort of like what Lockdown Cinema Club. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's doing. Uh, you know, if we make our our recorded shows available online for a limited time, um, and then people can pay to 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 view, yeah. Yeah. basically, and maybe there's some income that can be derived from that. But of course, it comes with its own unique set of problems, such as like online piracy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Of, so many so, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So you talked about your work in Congress and you talked about your passion for theater and all the work you've done there and the fu- this new foundation that you guys have started or, or the, the private entity rather. How was your transition from being in theater, doing what you love, your passion and just taking the leap into politics and thriving in it? I mean, you're doing great, man. Like everything I do sort of leads into something and everything I learned from, from that, I get to apply into that next thing. So like with the gamut of, of uh, things that I've undertaken since I, even since I was a student, because I was already working when I was in college. Um, I, was a, I was a working theater actor um, and a columnist for the Philippine Star then. Everything I've learned sort of, I've just been able to apply in this like, arena of policy <laughs> of government uh, legislation. of legislation <laughs> uh, and of course you know congressmen congressmen yeah, in the sure. country are also quasi executives uh, you also have to provide your services business. to the yeah. people to your constituents because yeah. that's the kind of service that they understand um, not so much the the laws that you're able to craft mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I've just been able to apply all these skills that I've learned from being a journalist of more than a decade, uh, from being a theater artist, and then into being a director, into being a producer, where you start to learn organizational skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, of course, if you're a director, you're working with actors, and you know, artists have... Well, you know, artists are known to have artistic temperaments. So <laughs> there's, a, there's also a sort of like a, a psychology that you also have to, 100%. to apply, to be able to speak to them in a language, in a manner that they understand. Uh, so like all of that, the, the curiosity in being a journalist and you're asking and asking and asking all these questions, like you don't settle for like the first answer, you dig deeper. Um, so the curiosity, that creativity that comes with my work in the theater, I'm also, I'm kind of able to apply that in, a, in the policy sector. So it's coming up with like new solutions to old problems. Um, but Admittedly, my challenge is articulation because, like, my language is different from the language of policymakers. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the lawyers. So, <laughs> lawyers, you know what I mean? So, it's sort of like, oh, so this is the, this is the big idea. 
uh, how do you demystify that? See, even the word demystify, like you don't yeah. use demystify in policy <laughs> making, but then like, oh, I use that in theater. So, or even in um, lifestyle journalism. So, so that's been the challenge, but then, you know, you know, four years into my stint as being a congressman, I'm on my second term. You, know, you start to learn like all of these like institutional terms, um, these, these processes that, uh, of, of how things are done. So I'm also learning a lot from, you know, uh, government workers from yeah. abroad and you know, seeing a common vo- vocabulary yeah. that emerges. So in a way, parang, um, it provides a different label to these ideas that I have, a label that policymakers understand. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, so yeah, I mean, the transition, I, I have to admit, it hasn't been easy. But, but it's been exciting. I'm, I'm learning so much. And, and I want to say it's also mutual because everything that I'm learning in government has also influenced my art. I totally relate to that. I think that I love what you said about how like, like the politics influences like theater. Because like, I feel like I haven't touched um, like directing in almost three years. But I've been teaching for like the same time. But like whenever like someone in little things like it, like someone asks for like Nick, Nick is editing his blog and he wants a second opinion. And then I watch it and for the after not watching stuff for a really long time, you realize you see things from a different lens. Mm. That's pretty cool. Right? It's like you're entering that old world that you're so familiar with, but it suddenly becomes different. Like your perspective. Yeah. Exactly. It's the, it's a paradigm shift. That paradigm shift, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been very helpful. So, parang organically, even Sandbox Collective, you know, when we launched it six years ago, our first show was Danny Girl, which is, you know, it's a musical about pediatric cancer. So, there was already a social component involved. And the next show was Boy in the Bathroom, which is about OCD. So it briefly mm. touched upon mental health. Yeah. Although mental health wasn't so much in the conversation uh, back then uh, in 2015. Um, and then, yeah, and then later on, like with my work in government, and then uh, so Sandbox took a hiatus, I got into government. And then when we, I got back into theater because I realized that theater is an outlet it helps me cope also with like a lot of things that you have to deal with uh in life and also in government <laughs> um, uh, yeah we came, back, we came back with you know we came back with him a lot and then we did lungs which touches on like global warming and then every brilliant thing which is about mental health um so yeah like a lot of the shows that we've been uh choosing uh or that we've been doing are shows that have a social component or an advocacy component to it. Um, but before all of this started, like I was with Nineworks Theatrical, I still am. That's that's the other theater company that uh, I'm a board member of. And it does mostly Broadway. Mostly Broadway and West End shows. So a lot of the shows there, like, you know, the spectacle shows, yeah. you uh-huh. know, the happy, happy, joy ones. Um, so yeah, in a way, my my creative my taste also sort of just evolved and like if you think about sound of music like it's happening with the nazis like you know there are nazis there yeah. and there's this family yeah, yeah, that yeah. has to escape and climb a mountain just yep. to escape them you know what i mean um and then south pacific uh there's like a an undertone of race um that's like embedded there uh, uh among the themes so, you know, there's this director, his name's Bartlett Scher. Uh, he always talks about the deep genre. It's like you read the surface of a material and you see, okay, it's about love. Okay, it's about hope or it's about whatever. But then if you dig deeper, there are all these like deeper genres that are embedded in it. Like I'm really curious because when I watch Every Brilliant Thing, I admit I purposely didn't really research on it. So I was really surprised and pleasantly surprised that it tackled mental health. Mm. And I think now more than ever, especially in this pandemic, mental health isn't being talked about still as much as it needs to be talked about. So what, do you th- what are your thoughts on 
I guess the mental the importance of mental health, especially in the Philippines. Yeah, uh, when we first did every brilliant thing in 2000. 19 uh, February. It was months after the IRR of the mental health law uh, was released. So it was so timely. Um, and it was also during the time that there were two high profile suicides that were reported in the media. Um, I think it was Anthony Bourdain mm. and Kate Spade. Yeah. 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 So it, 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 it was just sort of the, the conversation about mental health was coming into some kind of headway or climax. And our show was sort of there right alongside with it and that there was a timeliness to it. And uh, that's why people really came and all the shows were sold out. We had to extend like three or four times. Um, the show itself is like only 75 minutes long, uh, but we have a Q and A or a talk back after every performance, and sometimes the talk backs are longer than the actual show. That's amazing. Because like people really stay, and they ask the mental health experts that we invite all these questions. And um, I guess before you know there was a naivete about it and just uh, a lack of awareness. Uh, and you'll remember this TV host, Deba, that said that oh mental health, all of that, that's only for the rich. Mm. And then that TV host got bashed yeah. uh, mm-hmm. big time. Um, so there was a lot of um, confusion and misinformation about it. And But then you have, of course, government already had the Mental Health Act. Uh, the fact that it was made into law in this administration, I mean, kudos to, kudos to, man, to the administration for that. Yeah, uh, In terms of like the implementation of it, uh, it's sort of like in phase one and there's still so much that has to be done. The point is to bring it down to the barangay level and make it available, uh, these resources available to uh, stakeholders uh, because, you know, people now are, are, are people now uh, are growing into a kind of society that has a very, very close link with online and social media. You know what I mean? It's sort of like you can't exist now without social media. But saying that if a tree falls in a forest and you weren't there, then did a tree fall at all? Yeah. Now it's like, if it wasn't on social media, Never happened. did it happen? Did it happen? Yeah. Did it happen? Yeah. <laughs> 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 So it's like, so like right now, parang that's become part of our new normal, and it and with it has, uh, and with it came like things like you know isolation, isolation uh, from from others, from people you love, uh, this illusion of being connected uh, mm-hmm. when you're in the same Viber group or when you're in the same WhatsApp group, but then it's not really the same as when you are face to face with this person. And really having a connection and having a conversation. Exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, so there's increasing loneliness. There's increasing pressure that comes with social media. Um, and that, you know, the curated galleries of people that, that people see uh, sort of uh, makes you reflect on your own life. And you start to think that, oh, is my life not as, as exciting as this person's? Yeah. Um, it's a it's sort of like film where you know you only see the highlights yeah. of what happens in a narrative or even in theater the highlights of what happens in a narrative um, but actually there are so many times within the day where nothing is being said uh, you know it, it's quite boring or when you're with your partner or when you're with your loved one you guys aren't even talking yeah but then again social media sort of like distorted a lot of these realities and it's added a lot of pressure to the, the mental health especially of the youth yeah okay. of, of millennials and the gen z's totally. Um, totally. so yeah it has to be talked about it has to be destigmatized um i'm happy that the doh briefings that happen every day touch upon it occasionally na parang, uh you know there's these uh social me not social media sorry there are these mental health hotlines that yeah, people can single. access um, there are a lot of support groups uh, and a lot of private organizations and NGOs that are offering these services online um, or even just calling a number and then just having somebody talk to talk to. And it's especially important now during the quarantine. But this is a time where people really have to take care of their mental health. So, you know, do what you need to do 
to be able yeah. to yep. get stay through sane. the day. Seriously, yeah, like, if you need to disengage from social media, if you it's need to like sense. not watch the news for a day to take care of your mental health, then do that. And then exactly. just catch up later exactly. on. Exactly. You know exactly. what I mean? But yeah, no <laughs> talk. No, that's, thanks so much, man. This is like, I love your insights. They're so unique because you are coming from the arts and you're in public service. But I think that's honestly one of the best that's like, like, interceptions. Getting, getting, getting. <laughs> and I hope you guys are staying safe. We are. We are, you know. just. Uh, I've been going around. So I'm, building, I'm helping build those COVID centers. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, so been pretty busy. Uh, but staying safe, definitely. Taking all precautions. So I'm staying in my in my condo now. I can't go home and like uh, even our condo, there are other two frontliners here. So the building has taken extra precautions. So like we have to dip our shoes, we have to step into like a thing before going in. And then we can't be wearing the same stuff that we were wearing. So for example, if I leave a center, I have to take a shower there in the parang makeshift showers outside and then change into fresh clothes and put everything in a bag. Like we, we did like drills with the AFP to make sure na we're all properly prepared. It's the new normal snap. I know, so I know. I, we just but, have uh, to make adjustments. Please support Open House. Uh, it's an online fundraiser that is being uh, uh, spearheaded by Artists Welfare Project. Uh, Phil Stage, uh, of which uh, I serve as one of its officers. It's the Alliance of Professional Companies in the Theater, Opera, and Ballet Performing Arts. Um, SPIT, which is uh, the improv group. Happy yeah. Ferrari yeah. is part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Third World Improv, their school for improv. Um, Theater Actors Guild. And Ticket to Me. Do log on. Uh, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash love fill stage and then the other facebook page is facebook.com slash open house fundraiser so the schedule is there check uh, just check it out and join us anytime the, the 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 programs they don't disappear after it's done live so they actually stay on so you can check out even the other the past programs that have been happening since march 26th so there cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Tough. thanks nice. so much Yelling. Really great that Thanks you're doing all these initiatives, Talaga. And Thanks hopefully, for doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it, it helps, you know, keeps us sane. That's it. Yeah, no, exactly. You just have to, co- this is the perfect time to reconnect with people. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Have real conversations again. Have real conversations again. Not exactly. just like, how are you? Like you guys. I hardly see you exactly, guys. Exactly, man. Exactly. It's always nice to talk.